Good evening and happy Sabbath. Yes. We welcome you once again to the beautiful Plantation Seventh day Adventist Church here in Plantation, Florida. Right. We have been having a wonderful time, an exquisite time, beautiful time in the Lord as we have concentrated on Jewish ministry and really those things that appertain to the Jewish community reach into the Christian community, and we've seen that over the last couple of nights, Jim, in a very, very beautiful way. We really have, and last night we learned a lot. We had a one-hour session, then we had two hours of more just, just talking about yes. things, and uh, I got a call today from my friend David Adderley, and David's a wonderful man, loves the Lord, loves the Word of God. He said, I learned more last night about the Jewish people and the way that it fits into Christianity than he said I've ever learned in my life. And uh, we're hearing that from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And people are surprised at the outreach that 3ABN has. We're on 10 satellites around the world, plus we have 150 stations in the U.S. that are local stations, plus we are on Dish Network and 1,200 cable outlets. There are a lot of people watching this, and we are getting a wonderful response. And we are pleased to know that so many people are really interested in the, the interwoven connections between Jew and Christian and how one does not supplant the other, but one grows into the other. One is part of the other. They are really inseparable. Yes. And um, I got a couple calls from New York today also. Very, very fine response on last night's program and on this series in general. Yes, and we are looking forward to the next three sessions. Tonight we have Sasha Bolitnikov, Alexander Bolitnikov, Dr. Sasha, and uh, he is going to present the subject from old to the new. And uh, then tomorrow morning we have another session with uh, with uh, Pastor Alex, the pastor of, of this, this congregation. Mm -hmm. right. And then tomorrow afternoon, Ralph Ringer will sort of bring it to a head, put a little cherry on top of the Sunday, All and right. can close our, close our five meeting series. And this has been very, very good. Under the title, One in the Messiah, we've yes. learned a lot. That is right. We really, really have. Well, listen, why don't you lead us in prayer before we have our music? Shall we pray? Gracious Father, again, we come to you now during the sacred Sabbath hours. We thank you for this temple in time, this respite, respite from the cares of this world, whereby we have been called to lay down our work, our trial, our trouble, those things that perplex us, and rest in the arms of Jesus even for a little while. Mm. And so we pray, dear Lord, that you would be the center and circumference of all that happens in this house on this night. Be with speaker, be with singer, be with those here and around the world who will hear and listen and watch and consume what we have to offer. May your spirit bathe Sasha Bolotnikov as he speaks, but may it also go into the hearts and homes of those who will sit and hear and listen and see. And may their lives be touched by you tonight. We put ourselves in your hands and thank you for what we know, for what we know you are going to do in answer to the prayer of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor is going to be singing for us now, and um, I'm told that this is an original composition, one of his very own, Shema Israel. And when he shall have concluded this beautiful message and song, the next voice you will hear will be that of Dr. Alexander Sasha Bolotnikov. He is the director of the Shalom Learning Center in the Oregon Conference. Hear ye him. Oh Israel, Adonai your God, Adonai is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and strength. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today. Keep 
Thank you, Alex, for this beautiful song. It is really, it feels really good to hear the words of the central Jewish prayer, Shema Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord is one, at the beginning of uh, his holy Shabbat. And I wish every one of our viewers and everyone who have come here at Plantation uh, on this uh, beginning of the Shabbat, I wish you Shabbat Shalom. Um, the topic today which I would like us to contemplate on is a very, very uh, debated matter in the history of uh, biblical studies. It is about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. How many of you, what, before I ask this, let me ask you this. Uh, why do you think God gave the new covenant. How many of you believe that God gave the new covenant because the laws of the old covenant were too hard to keep? In Hebrew tradition, 613 commandments of the Torah. And by the way, you count them. You can read through the five books of Moses. You count them. That's going to be, depends how you consider sentences, between 590 and 630. That's why on average it's considered 613. So, is it because of in the beginning God gave that many commandments to Israel 
And now he decided, oh, I, I, I overdone a little bit. Let me make a new covenant. So it will be a little bit easier. And what about this? How many of you think that God gave the new covenant because Jews were so unfaithful to the Lord that God finally said, I'm through with you, and I'm going to pick new people. I'm going to pick pagans and Gentiles. Oh, by the way, since they're so pagan, they won't be able to keep up with so many commandments. I better reduce the requirement a little bit. You see, uh, all these thoughts are floating around in different books. And they all are rooted way back in the uh, ideas of the late second century presented by um, the early Christian leader known as Marcion. Marcion postulated that there are two different gods. The God of the Jew, Yahweh, who is the God of the Old Covenant, who is basically evil, harsh, loveless God, and God Jesus, the God of the New Covenant, the God of Christian, who is kind, accepting, and loving. So, for many centuries, the tradition was, oh, if you don't understand Old Testament, that's fine. Start with new, and you will understand the love of Jesus. Don't read the Old Testament, because it will tell you about the harsh and militant God of Israel. And what we have, we have a connection here. We have a negative view of Israel together with a negative view of God of Israel contrasted by the high view of Jesus opposite to his predecessor, God of Israel. Basically, it, and it has many implications to the point that many people believe that God the Father needs to be pleased and appeased by Jesus because he is that harsh God of Old Covenant. You know what the problem is? The problem is, the root of the problem is that we actually talk about something we don't understand the meaning of. We talk about the new and old covenant. We understand what new and what old. What we don't understand is what the covenant is all about. You see, I specifically framed the question at the beginning of our discussion to highlight the fact that the majority of the people think of covenant as something legal. And indeed, this is true. If you look at the usage of the word covenant in today's English, according to Webster and Oxford Dis Dictionary, 95% of the usages are in legal documents. The other five is in the Bible. The question is, do we bring outside definition to the Bible or do we try to 
understand what's covenant in the Bible. In order to understand this, I invite you to open the book, which is not very frequently read, but this is my favorite book, a book of Deuteronomy. And uh, this is one of the last chapters, uh, Deuteronomy uh, 29, and I'm going to read from verse 9, from verse 10, sorry. All of you stand today before the Lord, your God, your leaders and your tribes and your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones and your wives also, the stranger who is in your camp and so forth. Verse 12, that's the key. That you may enter into covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath which the Lord your God make you today that he, verse 13, may establish you as a people for himself. This is the key text. If you look at it carefully, you will see a very important repetition of two phrases in verse 12. It says first here, enter into covenant with the Lord your God. And the second phrase, and into his oath. These are very similar phrases. They are expressed in, they're expressing diff, uh, the same idea in different words. So this text is the only text among so many uh, verses across the Old and the New Testament that use the word covenant. This is the one that gives the definition. Covenant is divine oath. That's what the covenant is. It's nothing about us. It's nothing about our obedience, obligation, attempts to be good. Covenant is a divine oath to make his people. That's what God is doing. In fact, God is contrasting the covenant with the ancient ritual. The ancient Hittite ritual, Abraham knew about this. Back in his days in the uh, third and second, late second millennium, um, the uh, king would attack a city and city would surrender. The ruler of the city that surrendered wants to enter into a covenant with that victorious king. So what does he do? They have a road that leads to the gate of the city. The king, which is Victor, sits at the throne at the gate, and the ruler that is defeated stands at the beginning of the road, and they take seven donkeys. They split their carcasses in half and lay them on both sides of the pathway. And the king the, stands at the head of the procession, and the ruler that surrenders walk between these donkeys, making an oath. This and this shall be done to me, that <clears throat> if I break my promise, my covenantal promise to you, or gracious king who defeated me. You know what happened? Back in Genesis 15, God gives promise to Abraham saying, your reward is great. 
And Abraham doubts a little bit, says, how do I know that my reward is great? I'm getting old. And God takes him outside. He shows him the stars in heaven. And he says, this is how many descendants you're going to have. But now let's do this. Let's do, and and to Abraham it sounds like the Hittites do. Because Abraham wanders in the land which is in the sphere of influence of a Hittite kingdom, which is, uh, which is located in uh, Turkey, north of the Canaan. Today's Turkey. So, God says, take the three-year-old uh, sheep, three-year-old uh, uh, bullock, three-year-old uh, male goat, uh, and, and cut them in half. And so he does. And so he sits at the beginning of the road and waits for God to stand at the other end of the road so that he could walk between the animals he just sacrificed and split. And he waits and he waits and he waits. And you know what happens? In the fiery flame, like a furnace fire, God himself walks among the split carcasses of animal. The fact that given the promise to Abraham that if Abraham falls off from the covenant, he, God, is going to be split like that dead animal. Do you see that even in this, in the very beginning, in the book of Genesis, in the Torah, we have the same message as in the gospel. So covenant is divine promise, divine oath. What else can we learn from this word oath? This word in Hebrew is very rare. You know, the word for oath appears many times, but it's a different Hebrew word. That particularly in Hebrew, Allah, occurs only three times in the entire Bible. It occurs one other time in the context which definitely speaks about the sacred oath of faithfulness that wife and husband give each other at their marriage. That's what the covenant is all about. Have you ever heard the term church is the bride of Christ? Do you understand where the roots come to? It goes all the way down to the Torah to the definition of the covenant. In other words, God making covenant with Israel, the word is the same as God had married Israel. Let me ask you a question. Raise your hand, those of you who believe that you are holy. What? Okay. I see you having a problem. Okay, let me ask you a very similar but a different question. Raise your hand, those who believe that you are sinless. Do you see the difference? Holy is not sinless. You need to know a little bit of a background here. Tell me the word which is, in your opinion, opposite to the word sinless. Sinful, right? What would be the word which is opposite to the word holy? Well, unholy, that's true, but let me give you another word. 
It's a good idea. <laughs> Let me give you another word. In Hebrew, the opposite to a holy is adulterer. You know why? I'll tell you why. You got to observe a Jewish engagement and wedding ceremony to understand that. You see, the word holy, kadosh, is used elsewhere in the context of betrothal. In Hebrew, betrothal is making a future bride holy. What it happens is this. A young man at the betrothal ceremony approaches the young lady, gives her a piece of gold, and declares, Now, behold, you are holy to me in accordance to the law of Moses and Israel. What does it mean? If a young lady accepts this piece of gold, she becomes forbidden to any man except those, except the one from whom she took that piece of gold. Do you understand now the New Testament terminology why the church is holy bride of God? You see, anybody who accepts God's invitation to become his bride to enter the covenant becomes holy. Now, it doesn't mean you become sinless. You know what? Is there anybody here who is married over... 30 years. All right. Okay, tell me something. I want to hear that. I was married for 30 years and we never uh, disagreed or quarreled. Tell me that. I want to hear that. Doesn't happen, does it? Well, well. But do you understand the difference between disagreement or even quarrel and divorce? See, that's the difference. We're not sinless in our relationship with God. But we are committed the same way as even we had this, if somebody has disagreement with his wife. And even walks to the street to cool down. He is not going to the lawyer <laughs> to sign papers. You see, this is how our relationship with God are. We are not perfect, but God wants from us commitment. Amen. And if we are committed, we are holy. And we grow in these relations. Well, Israel had rough edges with God. Let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter 24. You know, we cannot idealize things. But in Exodus 24... It says here in verse 3, that's when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and receives the Ten Commandments and plus some commentary on the Ten Commandments. So verse 3 says, he comes down and tells the people all the words, the Lord and the judgments, and all people answer with one voice and said, And the were all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. That's commitment. 
what other ways do you expect? You know, you come to your uh, loved, beloved lady whom you think should marry, you stand on your knee and you say, shall you marry me? You know, there has to be one of two answers. There is no in the middle. She must either say yes, or she must say no. But you can't, you can't say maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> Cannot be. Or, you know, some ideas. Or they had to say with the help of God. I'm going to marry you with the help of whom? Doesn't work. You got, at some point, you got to commit. That's not bad. But things happen. You know, what we see in Exodus 24 is nothing else but God's wedding with Israel. This is making of the covenant. Look how it says here. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning. And he built an altar at the foot of the mountain. And then, men, and then he sent young men, the children of Israel, who, who offered burnt offering and sacrifices. And Moses took the half of the blood and put it on the basins, and the rest he uh, sprinkled on altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. That's making of the covenant. That's marriage. You ask me, how do I make this assumption? Let's go with me to the book of Ezekiel. Book of Ezekiel is very clear on terminology. Ezekiel chapter uh, 16. Here, how it says. Verse 8. I'm not going to read all the details. Verse 8, when I passed by you, and it's talking about Israel, and the verse 1, it's clear. You, again, and looked upon you, indeed your, uh, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you, I covered your nakedness, yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into covenant with you. You see again these two words? And you became mine. That's what making a covenant. God makes covenant with Israel is the same as God marries Israel or betroths Israel. Well, but unfortunately, things happen rough. The book of Jeremiah is very clear on this. Look with me at chapter 3. And this is interesting text. It says here, in verse three, start, chapter 3, starting from verse 1. They say, If a man divorces his wife, and she goes from him and become another man's, may he return to her again. I don't have time to spend too much on this subject of law of divorce in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 24, many people think that the Old Covenant permits the divorce, while Jesus in the New Covenant forbids the divorce. 
Look at how Jeremiah interprets the law of Deuteronomy. It's very clear that Jeremiah understands that the law in the verse 24, in, in Deuteronomy 24, does not legislate the divorce, but it addresses the situation of remarriage. And here it is. May he return her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? And then he addresses Israel and explains. But you have played harlot with many lovers. You see? And by the way, what Jesus teaches, anyone who divorces his wife except the adultery. So here is how Jeremiah the prophet lays out God's accusation clearly. And by the way, if you read the entire chapter of Ezekiel, you will see the same thing. You will see God starting divorcement procedure with Israel because Israel committed adultery. In which sense? English is kind of wordplay here. Adultery, idolatry. That's what it was. In fact, look at the Decalogue. There are two commandments in Decalogue that deal with faithfulness. We all know commandment number seven, right? But what about commandment number one? Thou shall not have any other God in front of me. That was the problem. Well, but is this all? Is this all? Look how the verse ends. God lays out the accusation to Israel that, she, that Israel played with many lovers, but then it says, yet return to me. Yet return to me. That's the grace. You know, things happen in lives. Things happen when in marital life, the situation becomes that two spouses divorce. But sometimes, after they separate, they realize they made wrong, and they can go back. Of course, if they haven't formed fam new families, they can still go back. And this is what God is saying to Israel. Israel, I divorce you, and you deserve to be sent away, but in my grace, come back. Come back. This is the God of love in the old covenant. Now, let's go to Jeremiah's view of the covenant and the new covenant. And famous Jeremiah 31, 31. Oh, how many things are said about this text. But it is interesting how in this same chapter, God says that I love you with eternal love. And here is verse 31. Hear how it says. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make new covenant with Gentiles. This how it says? Is your English Bible says Gentiles? Let's read. With the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Oh, I expect somebody jump up and said, Of course, who is Israel today? The church. 
Okay, let's read the context. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers. In that day I took them by hand out of the land of Egypt. Wait a second. Was a church taken by the land of Egypt? Which fathers is he talking about here? The church fathers? Give me a break. We need to read the text of the Bible. My covenant, which, I, which they broke. It's very clear it talks about Israel who broke the covenant with God. And look, though I was a husband to them. Do you see what's happening? I mean, today... There are so many speculations about what the destiny of Israel, people talk about some dates, 1948, 1967, you know, all this political confusion which is going on there. I'm not going to touch on this, but the Bible here is very clear. God makes new covenant with Israel. In the context of Jeremiah, God is remarrying Israel, whom he divorced. He did, but he remarries them. That's the message for Israel. This is the message that God sends to Israel and says, I'm going to remarry you. Even though you were not faithful, I was faithful. I am a suffering party. I have a right to declare, look, you betrayed me. But no, I am making new covenant with you. You see, it makes no other sense. If we're talking about the church, there was no old covenant with the church. The new covenant can be made only if there was old. The new covenant is with Israel and Judah. You're going to ask me how, because now I feel this idea blows somebody's mind, but let me do some explanation here. I'm not going to leave you like this. We need to see how this prophecy is fulfilled. First of all, I want us to read the context. This is how it says, verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write it on their hearts. Is this a metaphor? No. Believe me. The prophets of the Old Testament did not write in Greek style with metaphors and epithets. They're very concrete. I will write my Torah in their hearts. The question is, where was the Torah before? Well, very easy. The Torah before was inside the ark. Well, the Ten Commandments with two tablets were inside the ark, and the book of the law according to Deuteronomy, was sitting beside the ark. In fact, the Lord's presence was in a very specific geographical location. Deuteronomy 12. Deuteronomy 12 says... In verse uh, 5, 
But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place. There shall you go. Torah is very specific about the place of which Israelites needed to attend. I'm very careful. I'm not using the word worship because they worshiped in different places, uh, in uh, towns, Levitical towns. But that was the place where they sacrificed. That's where the place of the presence of the divine glory, the Shekinah. That was a very specific place. And that's why sanctuary or altar or anything could not be duplicated. That place, a location, was disputed later on by the people known as Samaritans. Remember the discussion Samaritan woman had with Jesus as it's described in, in uh, uh, John, in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter uh, 4. And here it says, in verse 20, she asks him a specific question. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And she points to the Mount Gerizim in today's Samaria. And you Jews said that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Listen to the response of Jesus. Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Then he makes a remark. You worship what you do not know. We worship, uh, we know what we worship for salvation is of Jews. So Jesus affirms that as of his time, as of the time when he is speaking with Samaritan woman, there is only one place in Jerusalem where divine glory resides. But now he continues. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. This is a fundamental prediction that Jesus makes that gives a pivotal difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant was centered, and Paul, when he comments on uh, Jeremiah 31, is very specific that the old covenant was centered on geographical location of the, of the sanctuary. Jesus says that the time is coming when the worship will be in truth and in spirit. What does it mean? Again, this is not a metaphor. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse six, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. It says, don't you know that you are the temple of God? And the Spirit of God dwells in you. What's happening? We see a transition of divine glory, of divine spirit, from the place up top of the Ark of the Covenant into the hearts of the believers. That's your difference. There is nothing about some legal issues, what the old covenant, the easy law, hard law, this is where the Holy Spirit is. The old covenant places the Holy Spirit in specific geographical location. The new covenant makes us the temples of God. How did it actually come to fruition? Very simple. Look at the Acts chapter 2. The Jewish feast of Pentecost. 
the number of Jews, thousands and thousands of Jews from all over place, because after the Babylonian captivity, Jews did not live in Judea. That is always neglected. That fact is always neglected by many Bible students. We often think that until the time of Christ, Jews live exactly as described in the Torah. Well, the Torah, unfortunately, does not address the phenomenon known as a diaspora, where a number of Jews did not return from Babylon, a number of Jews settled in Egypt, a number of Jews settled in Rome and other places, but they had their central location, Jerusalem, where they would make pilgrimage. And Pentecost, which is in the time of May, June, is the best time to do it. And what happens? Well, some of those Jews didn't even speak Hebrew. They were in diaspora for many generations. They come to Jerusalem. They needed a translation. Usually translation was made by learned scholars. But this famous day, the Spirit of God rested upon 12 Jews, disciples of the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, who began to translate to them the message of Pentecost. And what is the Pentecost? Pentecost is actually a celebration of the giving of the Torah on the Mount Sinai. So the covenant was made on the Pentecost originally, the marriage, and remarriage happened at Pentecost. God remarried Israel. Who was these Israelites whom God remarried? 3,000 Jews who mellowed by their hearts after having heard the news of Messiah and said, brethren, what shall we do? And the Jew by the name Shimon, Simon the Peter, said, repent and be baptized. And 3,000 Jews became the foundational stone of the new covenant. You're going to ask, wait a second, but after the stoning of Stephen, Jews no longer came. But wait a second, I want to show you something. I want to show you the book of Acts, chapter 11. And you will see what happened after Peter. The book of Acts, chapter 11. It says here, verse 19. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but Gentiles only. What does it say here? Do you read the same text I read? You see Jews, you testify that I am not making up the Bible as I go? Well, look who was these Jews. Some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene. That's the, those Jews who lived in Diaspora. This is what happened after stoning of Stephen. The gospel went from Judea 
geographically into the Jewish diaspora. And hear what it says. And they had come to Antioch. So these Jews who received the good news came to Antioch and spoke to Hellenists. By the way, Hellenists are the Hellenized Jews too. Preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And great number believed and turned to God. And news of these things came in the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sound Barnabas, a Jewish missionary to Antioch. And this is how the Christians came to be. Foundation. And the Hellenists and non-Jews tagged alone. This is the new covenant. As always be. The foundation is always stay. You know why? Think about this. If we suppose that God decided to divorce Israel and does not give it a second chance, would he give a second chance to us? Don't we all deserve the second chance? The new covenant is not a new law. The new covenant is a second chance. God says to a broken marriage, let's try again. Don't walk away from me. Isn't this a wonderful, gracious God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your grace.